Thank you, Ensemble, for that beautiful praise and worship music. Well, we are truly blessed this morning to have uh, Dr. Denny Autry back with us again. He's no stranger to Believer's Fellowship, but uh, he has served as Dean and Professor of Pastoral Ministries at the J. Dalton Havard School of Theological Studies. Uh, he's had over 30 years of pastoral experience. Uh, he's married to his lovely wife, Angela, has three children, and are members of Sagemont Baptist Church. As I mentioned, he's no stranger uh, to Believer's Fellowship. He has uh, blessed the men at several of the men's retreats and other functions that we have had here. So uh, let's give a warm Believer's Fellowship welcome, Dr. Denny Autry. Thank you, Brother Mike. It is good to be back at Believer's Fellowship. This is my first time to have my wife, Angela, with us, and uh, we're glad she's here with us today. And we also want to rejoice with you in honoring our veterans. Uh, our son-in-law, married to our youngest daughter, his name is Kyle St. John. I prayed all of our, we prayed all of our life that our, our children would marry uh, Christians, and she married a St. John. So uh, that was a pretty good thing there. But uh, he is in his ninth year, uh, active duty Air Force, and he is serving right now in the country of Turkey. And from Turkey, they fly into Syria with the battle with ISIS on a regular basis. And it is an unaccompanied tour uh, about a year and a half ago because of the danger in the area. All families were forbidden to go to the Air Force base there. And so at this time, she's staying with us and teaching right now. And so we're grateful to have her home, but we are grateful for the men and women around this world that are providing safety and security. Uh, we take so lightly the freedoms that we have and the opportunity we have to come and worship in a place like this. So we're grateful for that. And then men, I, I, just last January we had our time together at uh, uh, Paternity Pines. I had a wonderful time frame for those of you that were there. Uh, we had a good time in uh, talking about fortification, how God fortifies us in our walk there. And I want to talk with you today about the theology of forgiveness. Now, it's going to be a little deep here at first. You'd expect from a, a theological professor, it might be a little deep, but I, I want to make it very practical because, you see, forgiveness is something everyone wants. Forgiveness is something that everyone needs. But oftentimes forgiveness is sometimes too few to find uh, as those who are unwilling to give forgiveness. If you have your Bibles, we're going to start in Leviticus, and I'm going to kind of walk us through this theological study this morning. So turn first of all to Leviticus chapter 16. That's in the middle of the uh, Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament there. And in the middle of the Pentateuch, the, the law there, is the book of Leviticus. And Leviticus was given by the Lord to Moses there on their journey from the Exodus there. And Leviticus is described for us how man, how sinful man is to approach holy God. But in order to uh, get to this passage here, I want to share with you uh, a story from a, a German concentration camp during World War II. Because it sets the stage for us, because if I were to go around the room this morning and say, has anybody sinned, ever sinned against you, just a hideous sin, okay? All of us would have a story about how some individual has wronged us. Or even some of you have wronged others there. And so the need for forgiveness is a great, great need in all of our lives. But I don't think many of you have experienced such a story as this. This comes to us from Simon Weisenthal. Now Simon was a Polish Jew who was placed in a German concentration camp in 1941 stayed there until 1945. He survived the Holocaust. But some six million Jews suffered at the hands of the Germans. Eighty-nine in his family are relatives of him, his, basically died in World War II. He survived. 
He just passed away in 2005 at the age of 96. In 1976, he wrote this story, The Sunflower. And basically, it records for us an incident that took place while he was in this German concentration camp in 1945. He writes, I'm going to give you a little background, okay? First, he tells of, and this is a two and a half hour interview he's having with this individual there, while he was imprisoned in this Nazi concentration camp. He was asked by one of the nurses at the hospital where he was working. They had taken a Polish school and they turned it into a German hospital for German soldiers who had been wounded. And one of the corridors there was an isolation area there where the mortally wounded were taken there. And so on this particular day, one of the nurses came and pulled Simon from his work detail and said, come with me quickly. And so he begins to recount what took place there in this next two and a half, three hour interview with this individual by the name of Carl. Now Carl was a, an SS officer in the German army and uh, he had worked his way up. So let me just kind of read and share with you what he said. Simon says, upon entering the dimly lit room, I was overwhelmed by the sight of the man's physical condition. His upper torso was completely wrapped including his head, with only small openings for his eyes and his mouth. His bandages were blood-soaked and stained, and he could only take a, talk in a soft whisper. The soldier could not see, therefore he was just simply holding his hand up in the air for Simon to take hold of it. He says, with great reluctance, I took his hand and he pulled me to the bed. And he began to share his story. The young soldier began sharing his personal background. His father was a factory worker. His mother was a homemaker and a good Catholic. He had been raised in the Catholic Church, but he had renounced his faith when he had enlisted in Hitler's youth movement at the age of 14. He quickly rose in the ranks as uh, many do, and he was chosen as an SS officer at the age of 18. About two years prior to him being wounded and brought to this German hospital, he relates a story of being in a band of Germans that were ordered to go into a Polish city and to gather Jews. He says, they rounded up nearly 200 Jews, men, women, and children, and they took them to a two-story house that was too small, but they crammed them all in this house and they locked the doors. And then the SS officers were ordered to begin to place, pour gasoline around the base of the house. After they had gone the length of the house there, they were ordered to throw grenades into the open windows of the house. Obviously the house burst into flames. And Carl said, as I was standing, I could see in the second floor window there, a husband and a wife and there are two children standing between them. The flames began to rise. The screams began to become intense. There was no way to get out, and the house began to be engulfed with the fire, hotter and hotter. And in the midst of that, this man and his wife and their two children jumped out of the window to the ground, and the order was given, fire. And they were all four murdered in cold blood till they moved no more. Carl said that that has haunted him for these last two years, and I know I'm about to die. And so therefore, I've asked for a Jew to come and, and simply give me some absolution. Weisenthal says, as I sat there and began to listen, there were a number of times that I wanted to leave, but I felt compelled to stay. Yet Carl's question of the absolution, will you forgive me now, was too much for Simon to take. He jerked his hand away, he stood up, walked out the door without saying a word. He said, 
I've wondered whether I did the right thing all of these years. Thirty years later, he wrote this book, and as he wrote this book and shared the story, he asked 53 different individuals, faced with the same circumstance, what would you have done? How would you have responded? Did I do the right thing? He says he asked theologians, he asked political leaders, he asked writers, uh, journalists, he asked human rights activists, he asked other Holocaust survivors, he asked victims that had been involved in the attempted genocides in Bosnia, Cambodia, China, and Tibet. He got a plethora of descriptions of what was to take place. And to spare you all 53, I have chosen four to share with you because I want you to see that we are living in a day and age where people don't understand what biblical forgiveness, what true forgiveness really is. For example, let me just give you four. It's first slide number one there. Uh, Jean Amore. Jean Amore there is an Austrian essayist. He is a Holocaust survivor who was a Jew and as a result of all that he saw in World War II, became an atheist. He says this, quote, The issue of forgiving or not forgiving in such a case as this only has two aspects, a psychological one and a political one. Now that's a very telling statement to begin with. Only two aspects right there, a psychological one and a political one. Psychologically, forgiving or not forgiving in this specific case is nothing more than a question of temperament of feelings. He says, most likely if Simon had been confronted with seeing Carl face to face, eye to eye, or connecting with him in a more personal way, he would have probably offered forgiveness on an emotional aspect. But this next statement is the most telling. From a political perspective, forgiving or not forgiving is quite irrelevant. You see, the problem is a theological one. And as such, it does not exist for me, an atheist, who is indifferent to and rejecting of any metaphysical of morality. See, this man has no regard for God, no regard for the things of God there, so it's not a question that he needs to worry about answering because for him, God does not exist. The second one there is Matthew Ricard. Matthew Ricard is a Buddhist monk. Not only is he a Buddhist monk, he is the French language interpreter for the Dalai Lama. He travels with the Dalai Lama, and whenever there's a need for translation in French there, he is the one they call upon. He says, quote, for a Buddhist, forgiveness is always possible, and one should always forgive. According to the Buddhist teachings, an action is not considered negative or sinful in and of itself, but because it produces suffering. Now, did you get that? Buddhists believe that sin is not really a sin until it produces suffering in someone else's life there. So you can live the way you want there as long as you're not producing suffering there. Likewise, a virtuous act is what brings about a more more happiness in the world. True compassion must embrace all things and everyone. Let's just have a big group hug, you know, okay? The worthy, the guilty, the friend, the foe, no matter how bad someone is, we believe that there is basic goodness in them that remains, okay? So they don't understand the sinfulness, the depravity of man. Folks, we are all sinners, amen? I mean, you could tell it, those precious little babies that are born, and they're just sweet as they can be. I love those, that 9, 10, 11, 12 months there. You know, they just kind of coo and all that. But when they get to two, what do they do? I want my way! The terrible twos, okay? That's that little sin nature just kind of screaming out there. So their theology is all messed up. Keep reading there. In Buddhism, forgiveness does not mean absolution, but an opportunity for the inner transformation of both victim and perpetrator. Both individuals and society need forgiveness so that grudges, venom, and hatred will not be perpetrated as new suffering. A Buddhist would have said to the dying soldier, quote, the best thing you can do now is pray that in your future lives you will be able to atone for the crimes by doing as much good as you have done evil. They believe in reincarnation. 
and in your next life you're going to be better or you're going to be worse based upon your works-related theology down here. There's a Greek word for that. It's called hogwash, okay? <laughs> Number three, Alan Berger. Now, Alan Berger is simply an Orthodox Jew, not a Messianic Jew, an Orthodox Jew living by Jewish tradition. He is a professor of of Judaic studies at Florida Atlantic University. He's a former professor at at, uh, Syracuse University. He's the first founder of the Holocaust study program in Florida there. He simply says this, am I entitled to forgive on behalf of the murdered? My response is, do not forgive someone for whom forgiveness is forbidden. Judaism teaches that there are two types of sin. One that is committed by humans against God. The second type consists of sin committed by humans against humans. I may forgive one who has sinned against me. I may not forgive one who has taken the life of another. He just understands the concept of give and take there, okay? Number four, finally I got to try to get a, a good Catholic in here. Theodore Hesburgh is the, the uh, president emeritus of Notre Dame University. He says simply this, my whole instinct is to forgive. Perhaps that is because I am a Catholic priest. I am in the forgiving business. I sit in a confessional for hours upon hours and I listen to people confess sin. If asked to forgive by anyone for anything, I will forgive because God would forgive. If I had suffered so much, if I had suffered as so many had, it might be much more difficult, but I hope that I would still be forgiving, not from my own small position, but as a surrogate of our almighty and all forgiving God. That's a true Catholic sentiment on forgiveness as well. Well, What's the purpose of the story and all of these statements here? Well, whether you ask an atheist, a Buddhist, a Jew, a Catholic, or just some secularist out there, a theology of forgiveness based upon anything other than the shed blood of Jesus Christ is useless. We have no standing before God unless we come through the person of Jesus Christ. And there is no hope for anyone apart from that. So here's my question today. What does the Bible say? about a theology of forgiveness and how we are and how are we to apply that to our lives. Now, go to Leviticus 16. You thought I wouldn't get here, but I brought my Bible and so you open yours and uh, follow along on your tablet or on your phone or whatever you have there. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Might be a little bit different than your copy of God's Word. My first statement is simple. In understanding a theology of forgiveness, you know this, God is holy, man is sinful, Leviticus 16 demands a blood sacrifice. Now let me just read the first uh, seven or eight verses here, kind of summarize this whole chapter. This chapter is known as the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, still basically being used in Orthodox Judaism just back in September 12, 13, 14, two or three day time frame every year where Jews uh, experience this from God's Word because they're still living in the Old Testament looking for the coming Messiah. Verse 16, now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. I don't have time to go back to Leviticus 8, 9, and 10, but if you want to go back to Leviticus 10 and read that passage there, you'll be familiar with what's taking place and what he's referring to right there in verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Now we kind of just kind of gloss over verse 2 there, but I want to take a moment to remind us, as we have so aptly entered into worship this morning, thank you Crystal and team, you don't worship God 
based upon your preferences and your likes. You worship God based upon who He is and what He requires. Amen. This idea that, uh, well, I don't like hymns, well, I don't like choruses, well, I don't like drums, well, I don't like the organ, well, I don't like, I don't care what you like. That doesn't matter anything about worship. It's coming before a holy God at an appointed time, at an appointed place, as you will see in appointed parable, apparel, apparel, uh, with an appointed sacrifice, you come to God based upon His requirements or you don't come to God at all. And we have lost that concept in our world of consumerism, trying to be politically correct and meet everybody's needs there. You know, you're scared to death there. If we don't meet your need there, you won't come back. If you don't come back, you don't give your money. Well, I don't care. God's got all the money we need. Amen? Amen. Hello? We, we give, we worship, we, we, we owe everything we have unto holy God there. And those who came in a false fashion there, God took them out, okay? And now he lays down how we are to approach God for the whole nation of Israel. Verse 3, that was just free, that was extra, okay? <laughs> Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic, the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash, and with a linen turban he shall be attired. These are the holy garments, therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. I was thinking as I was preparing myself this morning, I said, should I wear a tie or should I not? And I got to thinking, this is Joe Arms. <laughs> he got saved. He don't wear a tie anymore, okay? But there is a specific way to present ourselves, folks. You, we present ourselves in the best fashion we can, okay? I mean, we didn't, you, you got up this morning, there was a little physical preparation, was there not? Yes, we had, to, we had to prepare ourselves mentally and physically to come into the presence of the Lord. That's exactly what's being stated here there. Verse 5, and he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of a goat as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is before him, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots on the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Now, you know the picture here. You see the picture here. There's, there's a number of things going on. Aren't you glad we don't live in the Old Testament anymore? Let me explain to you. If we did, when you came this morning, you would have brought a sacrifice. And all the staff would have been out front still putting those sacrifices there and, and killing them and making the burns before we, could, before we could ever come in there, okay? So thank God we don't have to do that anymore there. Jesus Christ is our high priest and he is our sacrifice there. And we have access to the throne room because of his finished work. But back then, they had to come and bring a blood sacrifice. And the high priest brought a burnt sacrifice first for himself and his family there to atone himself. And two more goats there were brought there for the Lord and the scapegoat. There's the first 10 verses there. Look at verse 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Drop down to verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, the first goat, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil to do that with that blood as he did of the bull of the blood for himself and sprinkle it on the mercy seat before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgressions for all of their sins, and so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among God in the midst of the uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all of the assembly of Israel. I go back to my first point. God is holy. Man and everything about us is sinful. A blood sacrifice is required. Eighty-six times in the book of Leviticus, 
it is demanded that the people of Israel bring a blood sacrifice before they enter the presence of holy God. That's exactly what's taking place. Let me point out one other thing. Drop down there to uh, verse 20. And when he has made the end of atonement for the holy place, for the tabernacle of meeting, for the altar, he shall bring the live goat, and Aaron shall lay his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away. Now, underline that little phrase there, send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. Let me point out three words here in verse 21. Number one, iniquity. Iniquity is the Hebrew term here for the sinfulness, the sinful bent, the sinful disposition of every man born in the human race. We have that sinful disposition. The transgression, the word transgression in the Hebrew is the rebellious spirit that comes from that sinful disposition. And the sins that we commit are the reflection of our rebellion against God and that sinful disposition that we have. Let me take a little more personal there. Turn with me over here to Psalms 51. You're familiar with this. Psalms 51. Don't have the time to go over it this morning, but if you'll go back over and read 2 Samuel 11 and 12, you'll be reminded of the story of David and Bathsheba. And when that sin took place, it affected all of Israel, David, Bathsheba, all of his family, all of Israel. This Psalms 51 is his confession concerning that sin. Look what he says there in verse 1. Psalms 51, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, my rebellion. Wash me thoroughly from my sinful bent, my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. You see, David's referring to Leviticus 16. He knows quite well that it is his sin that has separated him from a holy God. Go back to uh, verse chapter 32 of Psalms, chapter 32 of Psalms. Chapter 32 is connected to chapter 51, and here's where David finds out the importance of imputed righteousness. Hallelujah. Blessed is he whose transgression, his rebellion, is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, jot that down and just put a little circle around that, covered, okay? Because the Day of Atonement, when the high priest came into the uh, temple there to offer the sacrifices was only a covering, okay? The sins were covered for one year. They had to do that every year, over and over and over again. He's understanding the same thing. Verse 2, blessed is the man who the Lord does not impute iniquity. Hallelujah. Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, God has imputed to my account there His righteousness, and He's imputed all of my sin to Christ's account there, so I stand clean before God there. My iniquity, my transgression, my sin has all been placed upon Jesus. That's exactly what takes place when the, the priest play, prays over the scapegoat, and then he sends him away. That's Leviticus 16 required. Now move over to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Now, I'm going somewhere. Just follow me, okay? John, chapter 1. And look with me at verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is picturing without question Leviticus 16 and the scapegoat that has been prayed over, the blood placed upon him and then taken by a suitable man in the uninhabited place there, and all the sins of Israel have been covered and carried away. He says, here is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the whole world. Hallelujah. That's Jesus. 
So my second point is simply this. There is only one sacrifice, and that sacrifice is a person, and his name is Jesus. Keep going. John chapter 20. We see what he's doing here after he rises from the dead. Chapter 20, verse 17 says this. Jesus said to Mary, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but I go to my, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. What's he saying? He's saying, I as the high priest there have basically not entered the holy place yet, but I am uh, uh, up out of the grave there. I have been resurrected by the grace of God, by the glory of God there. I'm offering the sacrifice. I am the sacrifice. My blood has been shed there. I'm going to the father there and I'm going to be the fulfillment, <laughs> the fulfillment of Leviticus 16, right? Right here. And he was. The writer of Hebrews tells us that. Keep going. You didn't know you were going to study the whole scriptures today, did you? Look over here to he Hebrews chapter 9. Love this. Look at verse 6. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to his conscience. Concerning only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Verses 6 through 10 simply says this, without a blood sacrifice, we can't cleanse ourselves completely. But verse 11 says... But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sacrifices for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, through whom the eternal spirit offered to himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from death? works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. <laughs> I just get excited when I read that. Amen. We have a new covenant. No longer the old covenant of sacrifice, 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 sacrifice. No longer the old covenant of just covering over, covering over, covering over. We have a new sacrifice. Why? Because we have a new mediator. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he came as our high priest, perfect, spotless, without sin in him, without sin on him, committed no sin. And he laid down his life and he poured out his blood that you might be saved, that you might be saved, that you might be saved, that we might be saved, that we might have access to God Almighty in worship today. Amen. Now let's make it practical. You remember when we began the service, I kind of challenge you to think about somebody who sinned against you. Go to Philippians with me. I mean, I'm sorry, Philemon. Just pack, back up. You're in Hebrews. Go back to your left, okay? You don't know where Philemon is. Just go back to your left. One page. And you've got these little 25 verses uh, called this book called Philemon. Here's my third point. God is holy. Man is sinful. Leviticus 16 is required. There's only one sacrifice. It is a blood sacrifice. He is a person. His name is Jesus. That's John 1, 29. That's Leviticus 16, fulfilled. 
Philemon 17, 18, and 19 is Leviticus 16 applied. You see, without the application of forgiveness, reconciliation is incomplete. You know the story here. Look with me, verses 17, 18, and 19. Let me just fill you in. Paul is writing to Philemon. Philemon's a wealthy man, has a large home. The church at Colossae is meeting in his home. His son is the pastor. His wife is the host there. And he has a slave by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus' name means profitable. But because he was unprofitable, he stole from Philemon. How do we know that? Well, we're not sure exactly. But how would a runaway slave find his way from Turkey all the way over to Rome if he didn't have a little bit of cash? And in order to have that cash as a runaway slave, he had none. So he most likely stole from his owner, found his way all the way to Rome there, and lo and behold, the providence of God kicked in. And when he came to Rome there, he ran into this fellow by the name of the Apostle Paul. And Paul was preaching the Lord Jesus Christ and redemption and salvation, and this unprofitable profitable slave got saved. And he poured out his heart to Paul, because if you read the whole book there, Paul says, he became dear to me, became a servant unto me. But he said, I wanted to keep him here, but knowing his whole story, Onesimus probably confessed the whole story, I belong to Philemon. He owned me, I stole from him, here I am, I know Jesus now, what must I do? Paul says, I want you to stay here and minister to me, but I can't do that unless you go back and confess your sin and ask for forgiveness from Philemon. Verse 17, Paul speaking to Philemon says, If then you count me as a partner, receive Onesimus as you would receive me. A wonderful statement there. He's simply saying to Philemon, if you count me as a partner, it's a word for communion. If you, if you count me as a servant in salvation with you, then receive Onesimus as you were receiving me. Prepare the special room for me, the meal for me. Prepare for my coming there, but Onesimus is coming. Don't stop there. Look at 18. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, do you think Paul knew that he did? You bet he did. Look what he says. Put that on my account. That's imputed righteousness, folks. That's just exactly what I've shared with you. Here's God. He's holy. Here's us. We're unholy. Here's Jesus Christ who placed his righteousness on our account. Paul simply saying to Philemon, I know Onesimus is unholy, but he's a brother in Christ, and you're a brother in Christ, and we are partners together in this. If he's wronged you in any way, place that on my account. Why? Verse 19, for I, Paul, writing with my own hand, I will repay. And then he adds this little caveat here. I love this last part of 19. He says, by the way, not to mention that you owe me your own life as well. You see, Paul had, left, had, had led Philemon to Christ as well. And they were all involved in serving the Lord together. What did Philemon do? Well, the Scripture doesn't tell us. What did Onesimus do? Well, the Scripture doesn't tell us. I mean, think about this. He, Paul is asking Onesimus to leave Rome and come all the way, about a three-month trip there, all the way back to his home there. He didn't have to do that. But if he was a servant of the Lord, and he was submissive to the Lord, he would have done that. And the letter came, and I would imagine that knowing Philemon, who he was, and a, a godly man there, he would have done, as Paul says, even more so. And so what a great reunion they had. Isn't that what forgiveness is all about? It's when we come together in the forgiveness of God that bitterness and resentment and broken relationships are done away with.